just a tad. The title of our message this afternoon is The One High Priest Who Perfects It All. The One High Priest Who Perfects It All. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I cannot think of better news than the fact that there is a high priest who is interceding for me right now at the right hand of God. Romans 8.34, you don't have to turn there. I'd like to get that verse up on the overhead. That passage of Scripture would definitely overlap with Hebrews chapter 5, which touches on the reality of a great high priest. We can call him an advocate. An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And do you know why, why Jesus is in heaven? Because he successfully atoned for our sins. And do you know why Jesus is in heaven? Because God accepted his sacrifice. And Christ is in heaven because he rose again from the grave. And all power in heaven and earth was placed in his hands. And Christ is in heaven at the right hand of God because he's been inaugurated to the throne. And he's not there for himself. He's there for us. He's there for sinners who need a stand in righteousness. Who need a righteousness that they don't have in and of themselves. Who need an advocate that can deal with man but can also satisfy God. That's the day's man that Job talked about. You can read Job 9 in your own time. <clears throat> Job, when he went through his troubles and he went through his afflictions, he felt like he was all alone. He felt as if he didn't have an advocate, but he did. And the man that he described in Job 9, right around verse 33, that he called a day's man, which is an arbiter or an umpire or a mediator. He said that that man would be one that could put his hand on God and put his hand on man at the same time. That man is Jesus, the great mediator in go between the exalted high priest who has accomplished eternal redemption for those who believe because of him. All who trust Christ are no longer going to hell. That's good news. That's good news. Can we get that other verse back up there? Uh, the Romans 8.34. <clears throat> I, I want you to see that. That's the verse that we just mentioned there too. But I want you to see this word here. There's a man that's making intercession for us. And that's what we're talking about here. It says, who is he that condemned? It's a rhetorical question because the answer is there's none. If you're in Christ, there is none that can condemn you. That means not your sin. That means not the devil. That means not even you yourself. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died, yea, rather, that is what? Risen again. And because he died, there's no condemnation for us because Christ took our condemnation. And it says he's even where? So this is important because I taught us this before. God doesn't have a right hand. God doesn't have a right hand. God is immaterial. God is incorporeal. God is spirit by nature. He doesn't have a physical left side and a right side. He fills the universe. He's everywhere present at the same time. But we said the right hand in the Bible is a side of power, glory, honor, authority, favor, all of those things, right? And we're at the right hand of God as well in Jesus Christ. Okay, but he's there. There's a real person. There's a real God man in heaven at the right hand of God interceding for us right now. It says he's even at the right hand of God who also, present verb tense, maketh intercession for us. Isn't that good news? That's the one we're talking about here. And, and I don't know if you know this as we go back to Hebrews 5. You need a, a high priest. You need a high priest, and I do too. You need a mediator. This is why the Trinity is so important. Listen, for people that don't believe in the Trinity, if there's no Trinity, you and I are in trouble. You're in trouble. If there's no Trinity, you know how I know that? Because you need at least two persons. You, you, you need someone who can stand between you and God, who is himself God and man. You need at least a second person that can mediate between you and the first person. Does that make sense? That's why it's so important. And without an advocate and without a mediator, God would have to destroy us. There has to be someone that can stand in your place who is perfectly righteous to satisfy all God's demands and then to die the death that we were responsible to die in our place. 
So therefore, the law will be satisfied with us. There's only one man that can do that, and his name is Jesus Christ, okay? All right, let's work our way through our points. We're going to start at point three on your outline, okay? This is where we left off last week. And what, what, are, what are we considering contextually? This is what we're considering, the superiority of the high priesthood of Christ over, above, and beyond the Aaronic priesthood. Or we can say it like this, the, the, the uh, supremacy and preeminence of Christ's priesthood above and beyond the Aaronic priesthood. Or we can say it like this, Christ is better. How about that? Yeah, Christ is better. So if you're in um, the fifth chapter of Hebrews, I want you to see point three. It says Christ fulfills the Aaronic type priestly. Uh, I'm sorry. Christ fulfills the Aaronic type perfectly, right? The, in the Old Testament, under that old covenant system, that old sacerdotal system, there was a priesthood where there were physical priests, there were men that were offering animals and bullocks and sacrifices and, and so forth, but they were only a type of the real priesthood. If, if you didn't know this, when we get to Hebrews chapter 10, I'm looking forward to it. Hebrews chapter 10 makes it clear to us that in the Old Testament, the sacrifices that the priests offered up never put anybody's sins away. Did you guys know that? It makes sense because Christ already told us that a man is better than an animal. Didn't he tell us that? He taught us that in Matthew 12. And so, the, listen, the blood of, of the lesser cannot atone for the sins of the greater. The blood of the lesser, animals, cannot atone for the sins of the greater, humans. Did everybody get that? Right. So the animals, so then the question is, and how does that sacrificial system in the Old Testament work? It was only a picture, and it was only a symbol of the greater reality that would come, the blood of of the real Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ. That blood would really save us, okay? And know this, under the Old Testament uh, priestly system, that blood that was shed ceremonially, only ceremonially covered temporarily the sins of the people until Christ came. But it never put any, anyone's sins away. Only Jesus' blood put sins away, okay? Right, so they were a type and picture of the real high priest that would come. So letter A, let's work this through. It says, he was chosen by God from among men. Do you remember that last week? We said that the high priest did not choose themselves, didn't we? They were chosen by God. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> and Paul says to the, the Hebrew Christians, he says, for every high priest taken from among men. That means somebody else took them is ordained for men. That means somebody else ordained them to that office. And things pertaining to God, why? That he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Does everybody see that there? Right. So he was chosen to that office. Go to verse 4. And no man takes this honor unto himself. You see that there? That means Aaron didn't choose himself to be the high priest. Aaron didn't say, hey Moses, you know, I think I should be the high priest. And Aaron's sons didn't stand up one day and say, you know what, I feel like I should be a priest. No, no, no. They had to be selected out and chosen according to God's standard. Does that make sense? So it says here, no man takes his honor unto himself, but he that is called of God. They have to be called of God, as was who? So who are we making the comparison between, between Jesus and who? And Aaron. And we're learning that Christ is better, that Christ is is better. And then go to verse 5. As Aaron was chosen by God, and Aaron's sons were chosen by God. We saw that last week. We went to the Old Testament and saw that. In the same way, listen, Christ was chosen by God to be the high priest. You see the comparison? Christ was chosen by God. Even Christ didn't choose himself to be our high priest. Well, look at the next verse. Look at verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, you are my son, today I have I begotten thee. Does everybody see that there? So who chose him to be a high priest? His daddy. Y'all see that there? So Jesus fits, he, he fits the description, doesn't he? In verse six, one more verse, as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who said that to Jesus? 
his daddy. So verse 5 and verse 6 makes it plain that Jesus didn't call himself to the high priesthood. It was someone else that called him to it, namely God, right? Everybody saw that there. So, so verse, uh, so letter A again, he was chosen by God from among men. Now I have a question for you. What is the significance out of all the Bible verses that Paul can use to prove that God chose Jesus to be Christ? Why would he use, why would he use this example in verse 5? Notice this. He says, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, you are my son. Today have I begotten thee. Here's my question for you. What does God... Declaring to the son that he begot him and this day have I begotten thee. What does that have to do with Jesus being a high priest? All right, that's what we should be thinking as expository listeners. What does God saying that today have I begotten thee, you are my son. What does that statement have to do with Jesus being chosen to be high priest? I'm hoping that we can see the connection here. Let's run it through. The first thing I want you to know, you can write this down if you want or you can just commit it to memory. The first thing... That we want to look at is Jesus fit the qualification, number one, because he was a real man. We already saw that the high priest, look at verse one, every high priest is taken from what? Among men. So to be a high priest, you had to be a man, didn't you? Number two, to be a high priest, you had to be elected to it. Can we put up Isaiah 42, verse one? Isaiah 42, one. And there's two things I want you to see here. Number one, this verse will show that God chose him to the task. But number two, Isaiah 42, one is a good place for us to look to understand why we should love the, the doctrine of election. You should love the doctrine and reality of election. Look at Isaiah 42, one. This is God the Father talking some 750 years before the incarnation. And he says, behold, my servant. Now, who is he talking about there? Jesus, behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my what? My elect. My elect. So Jesus is the elect of God. And if we're everything that Jesus is in him, what does that make us? Right. So there's a real sense in which if you reject election, you have to reject Christ. Did you guys get what I said? If you reject election, you have to reject Christ because Christ is the elect of God and all God's people are elected in Christ. Very important. See, now elections start to sound pretty good now. huh? That sounds pretty good. All right. So we can see a clear verse here that Jesus was chosen by his father. Now, what else can we consider? I want you to go to the second Psalm, please. Turn to Psalms 2 because Psalms 2 will give us a little bit of insight as to the connection between Jesus being high priest and God calling him his son from eternity. What is the connection between these two? Well, several things. As you make your way to Psalms chapter 2, David writes this about 1000 BC. David believed in Jesus, didn't he? David trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. David was the great, 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 great grandfather of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote of him. And notice what he says in Psalms 2. Are you guys there? Watch what David says, those first four verses, he talks about the heathen and the wicked rulers coming together to try to thwart God's plans, and God laughs at them. And then he says in verse 5, Then shall he, God the Father, speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Now watch what God says in verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. The king there that God the Father is setting on his holy hill of Zion is Jesus. Is Jesus king of kings and lord of lords? Yeah. And then he says, upon my holy hill of Zion. What is Zion? The kingdom of God. Write it down. What is Zion here? The kingdom of God. We can even call it the gospel church. Because the kingdom of God is manifest visibly through the church. The kingdom of God is the uh, visible presence of the kingdom of God. It's the physical manifestation of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is everywhere the power and presence of God is. Where is the kingdom of God? Everywhere the gospel of the kingdom is preached. Everywhere the person and work of Jesus Christ is preached. And the gospel church is the visible expression of the kingdom of God. Did you guys know that? 
Right. So this is the, the, the kingdom of God and namely the gospel church upon which Christ is king. Isn't he the chief cornerstone over the church? Right. Verse uh, uh, seven. Here it is. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me. This is Jesus talking now a thousand years before he was born. What does that make him? Eternal God. And watch what he says. He says, the Lord has said unto me, you are my son. This day have I begotten thee. Didn't we just see that in our text? All right. Two things I want you to see in view here. Number one, God is making Jesus Lord over the church. God is making Jesus the king over the church. God is making Jesus the priest king over the church. He has a Melchizedekian priesthood. We're going to touch on that a little bit today, and we're going to develop it more when we get to Hebrews chapter 7. So you want to write down two words, king priest, king priest. Jesus is the king over the church. We just saw that in verse 6. But Jesus is also the mediator between God and man as well. Who put him there? You and I? No. God put him there. That's why you don't ever hear me say at the end of a service, will you please, pretty please make Jesus your Lord? I don't ever say that. Will you make Jesus your Lord? No, God has already made Jesus Lord. Is that right? That's Acts chapter 2, 36 and 37, by the way. Right. So we don't tell people that to make him Lord. It's two ladies already Lord. That's first thing. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is what does he mean here? This day have I begotten thee. Did everybody see that there? I'm going to tell you two things. One thing I think we'll be able to see. Another, the other thing, we might kind of scratch our heads a little bit. Okay, but we come to church to learn, don't we? Not just to sing. We come to sing, but we come to learn too, right? So two things. Number one, when God says to his son, this day have I begotten thee, I would say uh, secondarily, it's referring to the eternal generation of Jesus Christ. Where he says, this day have I begotten thee. This is a begetting or a birthing that took place by the father begetting the son in eternity past. Did you guys get that? Jesus was begotten by the father in eternity past, which means, therefore, Based on the parameters of time, there never was a time when the son was not in existence with the father. You need to know that because the Jehovah Witnesses tie most professing Christians in, not, in knots because they don't understand how to comprehend the sonship of Jesus. I want us here at Way of Grace to understand the sonship of Jesus. For Jesus to be the only begotten son of God makes him God. Listen to me. To be the only begotten son of God means to be the one of a kind son of God. And it means that the son was begotten directly from the father, which means he has the same spiritual nature and substance as the father. And because it happened in eternity past, it makes Jesus just as eternal as the father. Raise your hand if you got that. That's important. That's important. That's important. That's important because now when you say that Jesus is the son of God, you're affirming his equality with the father, not his inferiority. Because the Watchtower and, and, and Muslims and, and uh, BHI and some of these other groups deny the deity and equality of the son. And most Christians are not prepared for those battles. We need to know that. We need to know that. So he's the eternal son by eternal generation. That's the first thing. But secondly, ready, I want you to write this word down where it says here, you are my son. This day have I begotten thee. It's talking about the resurrection. OK, I'm, I'm going to show you right now, but I want you to write that down. I want us to know our Bibles. It's talking about the resurrection. That's the main connection between God's declaration that Jesus is his son and Jesus being a high priest. Now it makes, okay, now I see what Paul is getting at. Because there's a connection between this and Jesus' high, priest, high priesthood, and it's his resurrection. So two things. Number one, Jesus is qualified. This is one of the things that, that Paul is affirming. Jesus is qualified to be the high priest because of the dignity of his person. He's qualified to be the high priest because the Father appointed him. And he's qualified to be the high priest... 
because he's the eternal son of God. But he's also qualified to be the high priest because go to Acts 13. Go to Acts 13. He's qualified to be the high priest because he rose again from the dead. What is the connection between Jesus raising from the dead and him being the son of God? I'm glad you asked. Are you guys in Acts chapter 13? What is the context here? Paul is preaching in the Jewish synagogue on the Sabbath day because he went to reach the Jews with the gospel. And this is in Pisidia, Antioch. And he did this two sa uh, Sabbath days in a row. And notice what he says here. I'm going to start at uh, verse 29. Acts 13, verse 29. And Paul's referring to Pilate and the rulers crucifying Christ. Is everybody in Acts 13, 29? Okay, he says, <clears throat> and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. What is that? A tomb, a grave, right? Good. But God raised him from the dead. What is that talking about? Resurrection. Verse 31. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are witnesses unto the people. We're going to be celebrating that in a couple weeks. Because our Bible tells us that over 500 people saw Jesus after he raised from the dead. 500 people saw Jesus after he raised from the dead. Not just the 12 disciples. 500 people. It's, 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 it's a historical fact. Now, look at verse uh, 32. And we declare unto you glad tidings, right? Good news. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers. Here it is. Watch this. God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children. How? In that he has raised up Jesus again. See it? As it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Is that good or what? Do y'all see it now? The pastor didn't make that up. What we're doing is letting scripture interpret scripture. And we have an inspired New Testament apostle, namely Paul, that shines light on that Old Testament text. When we read Psalms 2-7 and say, hey, hey, let me let y'all know in the New Testament what, what David's talking about there is the resurrection of Christ. That's what he's talking about. The resurrect, by the resurrection of Christ, Christ was begotten again from the dead. Let me, let me tie it in even more. Listen, Romans, mm, Romans 1-4, please on the overhead. Listen. God the Father raising Jesus up from the dead was the capstone work of our redemption. Jesus completed our salvation when he rose from the dead. That's the first thing. Secondly, it was by Jesus' resurrection from the dead that he was proven to really be God's son. Y'all get it? I'm going to say it again. It was by the resurrection of Jesus Christ that he was proven without the shadow of a doubt to really be God's son. If he didn't raise from the dead, he would not be proven to be God's son. Does that make sense? He could have done a billion miracles, but if he stayed in the grave, our faith would be in vain. We'd still be in our sins, and he would be proved to be an imposter rather than the true son of God. Does that make sense? Look at it. Verse 3. Verse 3 and then verse 4. We'll keep going. Romans 1, 3, 4. Watch what it says about the humanity of Christ. It says, concerning his son, uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord, <clears throat> which was made of the seed of David. That's referring to his humanity. His humanity came through David according to the flesh. Verse 4. And declared, demonstrated, shown, and proven to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. Do you, got, you guys see that there? So it makes a little bit more sense now why Paul would refer to this event. Because it was by the resurrection, he was proven to be the son of God, Hebrews 5.5. 5, and it was by the resurrection, by virtue of Jesus' successful death, burial, and resurrection, that God raised him and ascended him and inaugurated him and placed him on the throne at the right hand of God as our heavenly high priest. Does it all come together for you now? I hope so. All right, let's go back to Hebrews. This is what the text is teaching. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 5. Let's go to the next letter. The next letter. 
chosen by God to serve on man's behalf. Y'all see that there? Christ was chosen by God according to verse 5 and verse 6 uh, to be the servant of mankind. Do y'all know Jesus' ministry can be summed up as service? Can you, can you guys get that? So I'm thinking of two places. Uh, Romans 15.3 is a good one. I was going to go Mark 10.45. But let's put, we stay here. Just put this verse on the overhead and we'll keep going. This, this should be a short uh, illustration here for letter B. God chose Christ to come into the world to be what I call the, the ox, the great ox for mankind, the great ox. The ox in the scripture was a mule that was used for agricultural service and labor, but also for bearing heavy burdens. Muzzle not the ox that treads out the corn, right? And do you remember the, the vision in Revelation, in Revelation 4, 6 and 7, that John the Revelator had, and he saw those four, King James says, four beasts or four living creatures. And remember, the first one had the face like a what? Lion, good, somebody knows. And the second one was like a what? Our animal here, an ox. The third one, the third beast had the face of a what? Man. And the fourth beast had the face of a what? Eagle. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew's purpose is to show Jesus as king. Mark's purpose is to show Jesus as a humble servant. Luke's purpose is to show the sinless humanity of Jesus Christ that came to be the savior of mankind. John's purpose is quite separate. It's to show the deity of Jesus like eagles soar high into the heavens. Jesus is the Lord of glory that comes down from heaven. Does that make sense? And they're in the same order too. They're in the same order. But the ox uh, demonstrates Jesus in humble yet powerful service. That's why we're going through Mark on Fridays. Humble, powerful servant. The servant of mankind. And his ministry would be depicted like this. For even Christ pleased not himself. He never did anything for himself. It was always for who? Others. Others. His father and his people. Others. Others. Lord, let this mind be in us which was in Christ Jesus. Our world would be a better place, place if more people operated out of that paradigm and we sought to seek others first and serve others first rather than serving ourselves. Wouldn't we be better off? But aren't we by nature more the reverse? Aren't we more self-seeking, self-exalting, self-applauding, self-glorifying rather than uh, uh, um, uh, self-abasing uh, and self-effacing for uh, the, the benefit of other people? We are. For even Christ pleased not himself... But as it is written, the reproaches of them, our reproaches, our sins, of them, that's us, that reproach you, that sinned against God, fell on who? All of our sins and reproaches fell on Christ. You see that there? Jesus was willing to bear all those sins. You know how big and strong and powerful you got to be to bear all the reproaches of all your people from the beginning of time till the end of time? You need to be an ox, don't you? Yeah, you need to be an ox. And then uh, Mark 10, 45, if we can get that up. If we can't, then I'll just uh, quote it. Mark 10, verse 45 is one verse that sums up the theme of the gospel of Mark. Jesus says here, for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to serve. And to what? Give. See it? And to give his life a ransom for many. That's why he came. The ox that came to bear our sins was the ox that came to be butchered and slaughtered in order to atone for our sins. Is that the gospel, folks? And now, guess what we're called to be? Little oxen. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. What does that make us? Oxen. Did you get that? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Yoke. Is for oxen. Write it down. You're a, you're a little oxen. You learned a new indicative for yourself today. You're an oxen. We're the little ox. Jesus is the big ox. And we get to be yoked up to the big ox. We don't have to do it all on our own. But the Bible does say in another place, uh, uh, bear ye one another's what? You got to be an ox to do that. Right? Right. We can go on and on with that. I love the zoo, zoological implications of scripture where we talk about the different passages that describe believers as, as having uh, um, animalistic virtues 
that are spiritual. It's really, really beautiful. Okay, so he came to do that, but he did it as our high priest. He did it as our, as our high, uh, high priest. He's the high priest, but he's also the sacrifice. The high priest offers a what? Sacrifice. Well, he's the high priest, but he's also the sacrifice. The high, check this out. The high priest offers up himself. Under that Old Testament system, the high priest had to go find an animal somewhere. No, this high priest says, no, no, I, actually, I'm the sacrifice. I'm going to offer myself up. What greater love than that, than that a man would lay down his life for his friends, right? And we can't come to church for an hour and a half when we got that kind of love. Some, uh, a man was willing to die for us, to save us from hell. We can't come to a couple services during the week and sing some songs to him and praise him, right? Right? Lord, help us. All right, let's go to the next letter. Here's the other thing that's really beautiful about your Savior. He is deeply compassionate toward the ignorant and the misguided. Now, that was a qualification for the priest, wasn't it? Now, you can't read verse 2 right without thinking about Jesus. Look at verse 2. The high priest in the Old Testament, it says, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, right? But doesn't that really make you think of Jesus? It should make you think of Jesus. Y'all kind of quiet. It should make you think of Jesus, right? Because Jesus is the one that says, I am the what? If he has to come and tell us that he's the way, what does that imply about our path? Right? There's a way that seems right to a man, there, but the end thereof are the ways of death, right? Um, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So we, by nature, tend to go out of the, the right path, and he has to come and uh, turn us around and guide us into the right way. And then it says he can have compassion on the ignorant, which is really beautiful. Can we get up Mark 6, 34? Jesus is preaching here. Well, no, first he's being followed by a multitude of people. These are thousands of people that are following him on the backside of a mountain. And I want you to see this because this really describes Jesus' ministry and it describes his nature. Remember this. Jesus is the express image of the invisible God, isn't he? And Jesus said, if you've seen me, what? So one of the qualities that you see about God when you look at Jesus is the word compassion. So I want you to write that down or just kind of commit that to your memory. Jesus is the most compassionate person in the universe. Compassion is not only to see someone in a uh, difficult condition or a plight, but it's also the uh, desire and the, the compelling from within to be moved to actually do something about their condition. Okay, that's compassion. Um, and we know in the New Testament, it's that Greek term splechnos or, or splechna or splechnitzomai. It means to be moved in one's bowels with pity and mercy toward that individual. Christ was here too. It says when he saw all these people, notice how he saw all these, these crowds following him. It says in Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with what? That's our Savior's middle name is compassion. He saved you out of compassion. He saw us perishing in our lost state on our way to hell. And he had compassion and came and did something about our condition. He said, in order for me to save them, I got to take on one of their bodies. I got to take on human flesh and come and live out the life they should have lived. And then I'm going to die in their place as if I did what they did. That's compassion. That's compassion. Uh, so he saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. Now watch what his compassion moved him to do. Because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. This is one of the most compassionate things he could do. Watch this. And he began to teach them. He began to teach them many things. You know, you can be compassionate to people by giving them a sandwich. You can be compassionate by giving somebody a cold cup of water. You can be compassionate by giving somebody shoes or a T-shirt. All those things, that philanthropic uh, endeavors, we should do those things. And those things are good. But the most compassionate thing you can do to another person is to teach them the gospel. Did y'all get that? I think a lot of churches today have it backwards. We should be engaged and involved in physical philanthropic endeavors. And we've done it here and we do. But the most important need for human beings is their soul, their eternal soul. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses what? His own soul. Does that make sense? Right. Very important. So Jesus did this with them, but he most importantly did it with us through the preaching of the gospel. Did he savingly teach us? Yes. Do you trust Christ? 
That means he savingly, effectually taught you. It's the most compassionate thing he could have done. Now look at letter D. Christ also offers for sin, but unlike Aaron, he did it exclusively for others, having no sin himself. So we'll be quick here because we touched on this last week. Just Isaiah 53, 9, please, if we can get that up on the overhead. While you guys are looking at your text, please look at, uh, look at verse, verse 2. It says, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself, the priest, also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought, the Old Testament priest, he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. That means the Old Testament priest, he would, he would take the offering and he would offer it up to God for, for their sins as their go-between. But guess who else he had to offer up sacrifice for? His own sin. Christ didn't have to do that. Right? So that's where Christ is in a class by himself. Christ only had to come offer an offering for us. He had no sins of his own. Because he was what kind of lamb? The spotless lamb of God. Now it makes sense. Those of you that are, I talk to different people and some of you are going through different Old Testament books, Leviticus and Numbers. Now when you're in Old Testament, every time you're in Old Testament, you see spotless lamb, spotless bullock. It can have no blemish and no defects. Now you know that that's really talking about Christ. That's what that's talking about. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Okay, check it out here. This is why Christ was qualified to save us. Beautiful verse. And I love how the King James words it. It says, and he, Christ, made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Didn't he? Who was the wicked he made his grave with? The two thieves on the cross and with the rich in his death. Who was that? Joseph. Y'all know that? Joseph of Arimathea. He, he let Jesus borrow his tomb. Jesus said, I'll give it back to you in three days. Right? I'll give it back to you in three days. Jesus could talk like that. Right? I'll give it back to you. And with the rich in his death, how come? Because he had done no violence. Because he did no sin. Because there was no spot, no blemish in him. Neither was there guile in his mouth. 1 Peter 2, 22. That's the Savior we love and worship. The perfect God, man. He's the only one, therefore, qualified to be your sin bearer. Only one. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. See it? All right, let's keep moving. Let's move on. We need to jump to point four. Please go ahead and go back to Hebrews and let's go to point four um, on your outline. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. See that on point four? Y'all know where that comes from? Those of you that read your Bibles, if you don't, you might not. It comes from Isaiah 53. Okay, this is really what we have described here in verse seven. Now we're kind of switching gears a little bit. The rest of our uh, uh, message today is focused on verses seven through ten. So let me, let me read verse 7 in your hearing. It says, <clears throat> Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Everybody see that there? Okay, we're still talking about the high priest, aren't we? We're talking about Christ. So what do these things mean? So uh, point four says a man of sorrow is acquainted with grief. That's Christ. Letter A. The high priest calling is culminated by his mediatorial offering. I'll be brief here, but I want you to see it. I'll say it again. The high priest calling is culminated by his mediatorial offering. Let me say it another way. In our text, in, in, in Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 6, it says the high priests were what? Appointed by God, right? So first they have their appointment, and then what were they appointed to do? Give an offering. So two words I want you to get. Appointment, offering. Appointment, offering. Appointment, offering. Okay? Jesus fits this qualification too. Let, let me show you uh, in your Bible how this is the case. We already saw that the high priest were appointed. They were appointed. Uh, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men. He's appointed for men. See that there? And then look at the last part of the verse. And things pertaining to God. How come? That he might what? Offer. See it? Appointment. Offering. That he might offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Can we say the same thing about Christ? 
Can, can we say the same thing about Christ? I, I, I think we can. How so? Like this. We're going to split it up like this. Verse 5 and verse 6 is Jesus' appointment. Verse 7 through 10 is his offering. Did everybody get it? I'll say it again. Verse 5 and 6 is Jesus' appointment. Verse 7 through 10 is his offering. He fits that model as well as the high priest, doesn't he? Here's his offering. Look at verse 7. We already saw his appointment. Here's his offering. Who in the days of his flesh, in his humanity, when he had what? There it is. See it? When he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to suffer, uh, save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he, su he what? suffered. That's the offering up of himself. See it? Does everybody see it? You know what we got to deal with today? Uh, how, does, how does the Son of God learn? I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to answer that today by God's grace. You have to ask that question. Wait a minute. How does the Son of God learn? And then look at verse 9. It gets even more tricky. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that believe. So this, the next question is, how, can the son, how does the Son of God have to be made perfect? I thought he was already perfect, right? That's what an expository uh, listener is thinking, right? So we want to try to answer these questions. So I think we saw his sacrifice. Can we get up one verse? John 6, 51. I'm not going to go to the, I, will, I, I plan to take you to other places too. Let's just do one verse. John 6, 51 on the overhead. So let's juxtapose these and we'll move to the next letter. The Old Testament high priests, they were appointed and then they offered. The New Testament high priest, he also is appointed and he also offered. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. How did he offer? Check it out. John 6, 51. Jesus said this. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven, right? The manna in the old... God never called the bread manna in the Old Testament. God didn't call it manna. The Israelites called it manna. We learned that before, right? The term manna means, what is this? What in the world is this? Because when Christ came, what did the rulers say? What is this? Didn't they? All right. Uh, uh, so Jesus is saying that bread that came down in the Old Testament really pointed to me. I'm the true bread that comes down from heaven. That if you feed on me, you'll live forever. Does that make sense? That's why we take the Lord's table every, every month. You should never miss Lord's table at the beginning of the month. Watch this. I am, that's an I am statement too, by the way. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. That makes his origin where? Heaven, which makes him who? Right. If any man eat of this bread, you can write it down. He's talking about his flesh. You can write it down. He's talking about his flesh. Watch this. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live how long? This is why believers can never lose their salvation because it's forever. And then it says here, and the bread that I give, I'm sorry, and the, and the bread that I will give is my what? See it? It's my flesh. It's my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world, the whole believing world, the whole repenting world, the whole elect world. Everyone in the world that feeds on this bread, have you fed on the bread? You know, you can you can come to an event where there's food and they can put out a big spread and they can bring out big old trays of all kinds of dishes and food and meat and kind of hold it out for you and put it on the table and you can see the food and you can look at the food you can describe the food you can smell the food oh boy that smells good right and then walk away and receive no benefit from the food because you didn't do what this is how a lot of people come to church this is how a lot of people come to church when they leave the church they can tell you what the bread looks like what the bread smells like but if you ask them did you eat the bread no no but i, I actually didn't eat it i just looked at it this is how a lot of people come under the preaching of the gospel and they never make it theirs. They never appropriate it to theirs. Says we just learned this in Hebrews 4. The word that was preached unto them was not what? Mixed with faith. They didn't appropriate it by faith. They never fed on the bread. So we all have to ask the question, am I feeding on Christ? Am I eating this living bread or am I just hearing about it? 
If you merely hear about it, but you don't eat it and feed on it by faith, it'll do you no good. In fact, you'll be even more damned on the day of judgment. Because where much is given, much is required. I implore you and urge you to not only hear it, but to feed on it. That's the only way it's going to benefit you. The only way it's going to benefit us. And how do we do that? This very simply, how do we feed on the flesh, which is the bread of Christ? This is how you do it. By faith, we eat the flesh of Christ by, by receiving the doctrine of the flesh and the doctrine of the broken body and the doctrine of the shed blood and receive it into our being by faith. That's how we feed on it. Does that make sense? And you appropriate it by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. This is what he's talking about here. Okay. All right. Let's go to letter B. Hope that makes sense. Let's go to letter B. <clears throat> A few more observations. Letter B. What are these prayers? And supplications and tears that Paul is talking about here. Jesus prayed. Jesus supplicated. Jesus cried. Do you ever remember reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where it ever talks about tears coming out of Jesus' eyes? Nope. Nope. You don't. But did he cry and did tears come from his eyes? Yes. How do we know? Hebrews chapter 5. Watch what it says in Hebrews chapter 5. And we are going to go to those gospel accounts. Um, and, and this text here will help shed even more light on it. It says in verse 7, Who in the days of his flesh, in his humanity when he was here, when he had offered up what? Prayers. And what? Supplications. And it says with strong crying and what? Tears. Our Savior wept tears. Our Savior wept tears unto him that was able to save him from death. And was hurting that he feared. So what does he mean by prayers here? It's petition. The word here, prayers, means petition. It, it, it means to, to entreat, to make an entreaty. It means to be in deep want or to have deep personal need. Deep personal need. That's why we pray, because we, uh, uh, we, we need God, don't we? And we need God to meet our needs every hour of every day. That's why it's no such thing as a non-praying Christian. No such thing. Prayer is the very expression of faith, and it's, it's, it's evidence of life in the soul. We need God. That's prayers. What about supplication? Ready? I want you to write down the word olive branch. It literally means olive branch. Okay? So it says, when he, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers in olive branches. Okay? That's what the, that word there means. Hikaterios. Hikaterios is the Greek term. Hikaterios. It literally means olive branch. And what does the olive branch symbolize, folks? Peace, doesn't it? It's an entreaty for peace. It's a prayer for peace. It's an earnest supplication for peace. Lord, I need peace. That's what it's referring to there. Jesus, as it were, lifted up an olive branch in his cries and his pleading to God. And this word supplication is a different word than the word used through the New Testament. This is the only time it's used in the New Testament. Only one time. It's right here. Only one time. Olive branch. And, and, and Christ had to plead for peace to God and yet had to go through the wrath of God in order to accomplish peace for us. He was really ultimately praying for your peace. Did you get that? He was praying for your peace. That's right. And did he accomplish it? Yeah. And then the last word here, it says strong crying. That's King James says, uh, yeah, strong crying. You want to write that it means outcry. It's a strong word. It means to clamor for something. It, it, I want you to picture somebody in your head screaming, boisterous screaming it means to shriek you ever heard somebody shriek i want you to think of a person that has been enormously injured and they are shrieking in utter pain because of the enormous level 
of, of pain and agony. It means to shriek with unearthly and non-human sounds. Imagine the pain and the agony and the suffering our Savior was going through to have to make that kind of sound in order to save us. And he was willing to go through all of that in order to redeem us. And then it says he shed tears. The Son of God shed tears to save us. Go to Luke 22. I think it's kind of incongruent. that The Son of God sheds tears for us and we can never, ever shed a tear for him. I think that's very incongruent. I think when the reality of the atonement comes home to us, I think there are times in our life when the Spirit of God breaks us down and we weep because of all that Christ had to do for us and because of the revelation of the enormity of our offense against God, such a good God that's been so good, so gracious, so kind, that's so pure and so holy that we would sin and offend such a good being. It should break us. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? Go to Luke 22. What is, what is Paul talking about here about his prayers and supplications, strong crying, shrieking and tears? This is what he's talking about right here. This is what he's talking about. Luke 22. Is everybody there? I want you to go to verse 39, please. This is exactly what he's talking about. So you can write this down. Gethsemane and Calvary. Gethsemane and Calvary. That's what this is talking about. Gethsemane. And Calvary. Okay, look at Luke uh, 22, verse 39. Luke 22, 39. It says, And he came out and went as he was wont, as his custom was, to the what? Mount of Olives. As, and his disciples followed him. The Mount of Olives is where the Garden of Gethsemane was. Verse 40, and when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray ye that you enter not into temptation. Who is he talking to? Good, his disciples. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, about as far as you can throw a little stone. Maybe 40, 50 feet. And he kneeled down and he prayed. That's what, that's what our text is talking about. And he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. What is the cup? The wrath of God. It's not a literal cup. It's symbolic of the wrath of God. Father, if there be any other way, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, look at our Savior. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's a glorious Savior, isn't it? That's right. Not my will. But you're, that means essentially there's two wills there. That shows the distinction between the Father and the Son. There is a trinity. But the will of the second person submitted to the will of the first person in order that you and I would be saved. In order that we would be saved. Now, he said, if there's any other way, right? And did a voice come from heaven? Look at the next verse. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Okay. I know I'm getting ahead, but I'm actually answering the question on the next verse. If you guys are following along. So God did answer his prayer. Is there any other way, Father? No. So I'm going to send an angel to strengthen you so you can finish the job. I'm sending an angel to you because I love you. And I'm sending an angel to you to strengthen you in your human flesh so you can go through and finish the task. Yep, he answered him. Verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, Great drops of what? Hematidrosis. Hematidrosis is the medical term for sweating blood. Hematidosis is a very rare condition, but it happens in the presence of the enormous weight of stress and anxiety on a soul that causes the body's anatomical physical response to be a sweating out of blood. Imagine the weight of the fear and the anxiety and the worry that was on Christ. Not a sinful, not a sinful stress, not a sinful worry. 
but the weight of the sins of all of God's people was beginning to come down on Christ. And Christ was beginning to feel the separation from his daddy. And it stressed him so much, this pure, sinless being that had no sin, did no sin, in him was no sin, is now beginning to take upon himself the sins of all of God's elect. And because of that, God had to turn his back on him. This caused our Savior to sweat great drops of blood. It says he sweat as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Verse 45, and when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. That's what our text is talking about, this event right here. Okay? The praying, the supplicating, the strong crying, and the tears. Now, Matthew 27, 45 on the overhead, if we can get that on the overhead. Let's go ahead and start making our way back to our text. But you're going to go back to Hebrews 5. I just want you to see this on the overhead. This would be included in that praying and supplicating and crying, shedding tears and screaming. There wasn't anything dignified about it. He was, for the first time in his existence, he was feeling separation between him and his daddy. And for the first time, he was having sin imputed to him. He who knew no sin. Look what it says here. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness. We know that there was a great worldwide eclipse that took place on this very day. The whole world became dark. For three hours. Okay. And it says from the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the land. Until the ninth hour. Why is that? God closed the curtain. On his dealings with his son. Because for those three hours. God had to pour out his white. Hot. Unmitigated wrath and fury. On his son. In such a way that no human eye. Could bear the sight of it. He closed the curtain so that he could deal with his son in private and pour out his wrath on his own son in order that he would rescue us and save us. Okay, we can make an application too. There are times, you that are parents, where it's time to chasten our children. Our world would tell us that it's wicked for parents to chasten their children. But the father chastened his son. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Isn't that what the Bible said? But you should never do it in a way by which you humiliate your child and embarrass them and, and bring them to ignominy before the watching eyes of other people. The, the father closed, his, uh, closed the curtains first before he chastened his son. We should do the same thing. Anytime we have to punish our children, we're doing it because we love them. We're doing it out of, out of correction. We're doing it for their good. But we should never do it in a way by which we shame them or embarrass them. Does that make sense? We can learn from our Heavenly Father. Okay, look at the next verse. And we got to hurry up. This is included in that crying. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, <clears throat> saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Y'all see that there? This would be including in the crying and the praying. Christ had to be temporarily forsaken by his daddy in order that his father would never have to forsake us. Okay, this is Psalms 22. Did you know Psalms 22 gives us an answer to this? Psalm 22, verse 1 on the overhead. We can look at this real quick. Now, let's turn there. <clears throat> let's turn there real fast. We probably should just, uh, let's see here. All right. Let's turn it real quick. Psalms 22 is recording Jesus on the cross, by the way. Some would say, well, that was a thousand years before Christ. Yeah, it was. But all the scriptures are about Christ. And it describes, you read the whole chapter, it describes his crucifixion to a T. In some ways, in some ways, even more precisely than the New Testament. It, it's really amazing. Uh, if you're in Psalms 22, look at the first verse. Same verse we just read. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is that Jesus talking through the psalmist? Yeah. Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, why was God so far from helping him? 
so he could help us. Did you hear that? So he could help us. Verse 2. Oh my God, I cry. There's a crying again, right? I cry in the daytime, but you hear not. And in the night season, and am not silent. Why is God not hearing his son? So he could hear us. So he could hear us. Verse 3, he, he, Jesus answers his own question, right? Verse 1, he says, why have you forsaken me? Verse 3, he answers himself. All right, verse 3, he says, but you are holy. That's why. That's why he forsook him. Because he's holy. And his eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. And because God is holy, he must punish sin. And because he's holy, he didn't even spare his own son when our sins were placed on him. Because he's holy, he must punish sin. And because he punished sin, he can rightly and justly justify us. Because the ransom payment was paid in the person of Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we got an answer to that. We got an answer to that. All right, so let's go back to our text. And then also, um, it was by his resurrection that God answered him. I want you to know that. Okay? Go back to Hebrews 5, 7. <clears throat> if you look at Hebrews 5, 7, see where it says, uh, verse 7, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was what? Heard, heard, and your outline says hearing equals answering. Hearing equals answering. Okay, so he was heard, which means in a sense he was answered because that word hearing here means to listen or to heed, to heed or to comply with. So he did hear him. There's a sense in which he did not hear him and there's a sense in which he did hear him. He did not hear him for those three hours. He had to let him go through with the suffering. But he did hear him on the third day when he raised him from the dead. Did he deliver the son from the grave? Yes, he did. So he heard his cry. He heard his plea and he received his sacrifice and he raised him. And he also raised us up in him, too. Right. All right. Our last uh, number for today is point five. Go to point five. And point five says the experiential and saving obedience of Jesus Christ. Everybody see that on point five? So this is what I want us to see in verse eight. It says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He learned obedience. So a couple of things that that teaches us. Look at letter A. Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. So that means though he was a son, he was not exempt from suffering. Though Jesus was a son, he was not exempt from suffering. You know what that tells me and you? You can put up Romans 8, 32. You know what that tells us? Neither are, neither are you. Neither am I. Right? If, if God's only son was not exempt from suffering, that means none of his sons are exempt from suffering. And all of us, in a sense, in Christ, are all sons. Because it was the son that received the inheritance under the old covenant. So that symbolizes all believers that are in his only begotten son. So if Jesus was not exempt from suffering, why would we think that we should never suffer? Does that make sense? All right, we're not exempt from suffering. In fact, I want you to look at it this way. Your suffering then should not be construed as a denial of your sonship, but as an affirmation of your sonship. Did you get that? Your suffering should be looked at you not as a denial. Well, if I'm suffering, God must not love me because I'm struggling to pay my bills. Or maybe I lost my job and I'm struggling to make ends meet. That must mean that God doesn't love me. No, 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 no. If you're struggling and you're suffering and the Savior also suffered and we're sons and he's a son, if he suffered, then we should expect to suffer. And Suffering for believers is a part of the sanctification process. It's for our good. It's actually a seal of God's approval toward us and his love for us. Remember this. He only chases those that he loves. 
Isn't that what the Bible says? He only chastens those that he loves. The Bible says, no, don't get mad at me. This is Hebrews 12. Those who receive not chastisement are bastards. That's Hebrews chapter 12. That's what it says. Okay. Pastor's not up here cussing. Okay. That's Hebrews 12. Right. Five through 11. You can read it your own time. He only chastens his sons. Right. So it actually is an affirmation of your sonship. See here. He that spared not his own son. But delivered him up for us all. All of us who believe. How shall he not with him also freely what? Give us everything that's necessary for life and godliness. If he gives us the greater, won't he give us the lesser? He'll, he'll, he'll take care of our temporary needs if he took care of our eternal needs in Christ. Right? So we can trust him. That's all. That's what I wanted you to see there. Uh, letter B. Let's just run through these real quick. I have two questions for you. How in the world can the Son of God learn? Do y'all see that there in the text? Are y'all interested? Look what it says. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience. I thought the son of God was God. You just said earlier he's eternal. He's God. What do you mean he had to learn? You should be interested in wanting to know how to, how, how to understand that. Okay. What in the world does that mean? Okay. Under your outline, it says a practical and experimental reality. That's what it's talking about. Okay. As God, he can't learn anything. But as a man, he can. As a man, he can. How did he learn? Through the experience. He learned experientially. He learned experimentally what it was like to become flesh and blood and to have to depend on God, pray to God, trust God, walk by faith, be led by the Spirit, Go through his life, obeying all God's commandments, obeying them all, and then having to go through with the experience of suffering and being nailed to a cruel, rugged cross in order to save us. He knew what he was going to have to go through before he came. We already know that. But as a man, he had never experienced that before. So he learned obedience experimentally through the things that he suffered. That's what it means. OK, that's all. I'm trying to give you the, sh the short version there. Ah, oh, there's a bunch of verses. Um, let's do this. Just put up Luke 2.52. Let's condense it. Luke 2.52, if we can get that up. Okay, so as a man, he learned through his life experience what it was like to live and trust and obey God even to the point of death. That's something he had never experienced before. And while our elders putting up Luke 52, I got Luke 2.52, I got a question for you. If Jesus learned, why would we think we don't need to learn? Does that make sense? If Jesus learned, in some senses, why would we think that we don't need to learn? Some of us can think, well, I, you know, I got my life experiences. I've been around a long time. I, I, there's not really anything for me to learn. Jesus wasn't like that. If you're still here, that means you still have something to learn. It doesn't matter if you're 130 years old. You and I still have something to learn. Okay. To be a disciple is to be a learner. Y'all know that? To be a disciple. If you're really a disciple of Christ, you're a learner. Take my yoke upon you and there it is. Right, right. Now, watch this. Don't struggle with this. We might just wrap it up right here. Uh, look at Luke 2.52. <clears throat> it says, and this is when Jesus was 12 years old. He was in the temple. His parents left him. They're going back to Nazareth and they forgot, they forgot their son. <laughs> like, Where's our son at? You ever done that? That's what happens when you start having a bunch of kids. You start counting them. Okay, one, two, three. We do that all the time. Okay, one, two, three. Oh, we're number five. And they left him in the temple and they came back and they got their son and he submitted to his parents and he went back home with them. But notice what it says. Jesus increased. He's God. How can he increase in his humanity? Notice what it says. He increased. That's a growth. He increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. See that? He increased in, in, in wisdom. Okay. He increased in wisdom. Mentally. He increased in stature. Physically. He increased in favor with God. Spiritually. And man. Socially. There's four branches there. Does everybody get that? You want to write those down. Because you and I should aspire to grow in all four of those areas. Well, for most of us, we've already stopped growing physically, right? If you're an adult, you've passed that age. But we still have the other three areas to continue to grow. You youth, 
still have your growth plates and there's space there, then you have all four. And it's a blessing because in every area that you grow as an adult and as a child, you're being like Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? And nobody should stunt that process. You shouldn't desire to stunt that process. Every day you should be asking the Lord, okay, teach me something new about your person, your work, your nature, your character, your word, your will, and what you would have me to do. That should be your desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? And it's really beautiful that the Lord of glory actually came down so low and humbled himself to have to go through this growth process and maturation process in order to save us. So I think what I'm going to do here is I think I'm going to wrap it up at point B, and I think we're going to try to develop this a little bit more next week. What I'm looking forward to doing next week is answering the question even further, how is it that the Son of God can learn that's letter B. And letter C, how is it that the Son of God can be made perfect? How can he be made perfect? Look at verse 9. In being made perfect, I thought he was already perfect. So we got a little bit of work to do because there is a sense in which the Son of God, the spotless lamb, had to be made perfect. What does that mean? So I hope that you have a hunger and a thirst to want to know that. And then how is his priesthood like Melchizedek? Verse 10. I'm looking forward to getting into these things. God bless you. Amen. Stop there.